Dear Heavenly Father, we make way in our hearts for you. God, we open up our hearts. We say, God, come. Have your will. Have your way in us. Just like Jesus taught his disciples to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. God, we say the same thing in our hearts and in our lives. God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here in us. God, we thank you that you are not a God who is far off, you are not a God who, is, who cannot see or cannot hear. You are not a God who does not speak. But you are real, and you are with us, and you are here. And God, today we open up our lives to you. We open up our heart to you. And in your presence, oh God, in your presence, chains are broken. In your presence freedom is experienced where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty there is freedom the eye the blind eyes see the lame walk it's not just a story in a book that we read but it's the God that we experience today God you're still doing miracles God we embrace you we embrace your ways. We embrace your truth. And in your presence, God, we submit. We bow down. We bow our hearts before you. We surrender to you. And we say, God, have your way in our lives. God, we thank you for the work that you have done. We thank you that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. God, you have begun a good work, but you're going to complete it. And we stand in faith upon that truth. And therefore, we open our hearts for you to complete the work that you have begun in us, God. Today and every day, God, make us more like you. Make us like you, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Amen. What a great time in the presence of God, in worship, in surrender, and praise to God. God is good. God is real. He's here and he's with us. He's not far off, but he's near. He's with us. Today we're going to continue in our series about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin, I want to read kind of the text that we're, uh, we're studying from the Bible. And I just want you guys to listen to this. I'm reading from the New King James, and it's 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 11. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Okay, so we'll see that all of these are through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So this is what we're talking about right now in our series uh, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we began just by talking about some of the things that we see in 1 Corinthians and some of the things that Paul was addressing as he wrote this letter to the, the, the church in Corinth. But now we're going to look at each one of these uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about them, and we're going to just kind of see what God meant when he was writing about the, the Bible about the, these gifts of the Holy Spirit, but also how we can use them in our daily lives. Before we begin, I want to tell you three stories. Two of them are from the Bible. One of them is from real life. I mean, it's all real life. The Bible's real life. The, real, the Bible happened, really happened uh, a number of years ago. But the third one is going to be a story that happened just a few years ago that kind of illustrates 
what we're going to be talking about today. The first one happened in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and it's the story of Jesus and a man named Nathaniel. Now, Jesus, it's important to realize that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. If we read in Luke and in different, uh, different parts of the Gospels, we'll see that Jesus, he was led by the Holy Spirit. And so, as Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit, we can expect to be led by the Holy Spirit just like Jesus was. Now, I want you to see these two stories. The first one is, is here in John, four, uh, sorry, John chapter 1, verses 43 to 49. Listen to what happens in this. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. So this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's calling his disciples, and he said to Philip, come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael. So Philip and Nathanael were friends. And, Nathan and Philip said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael. So Jesus was there and saw Nathanael and Philip coming towards him. And, it, and Jesus looked up at Nathanael and he said, Behold an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Some other versions of the Bible, they say, in whom is no guile. There's nothing hidden or there's nothing, nothing that he hasn't shown. Everything that we see in Nathanael is, is truly who he is. So Jesus said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to Jesus, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were sitting under the fig tree, I saw you. So Jesus had a, 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 a thought or an idea from the Holy Spirit about Nathaniel, who he saw. And in that thought, the Holy Spirit revealed to Jesus that Nathaniel was sitting under that fig tree. And Jesus said to him, he says, before Philip even met you and called you to come and see, I saw you there. I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So there was something that happened in that moment. The Holy Spirit revealed to Jesus something about the life of Nathaniel. Maybe it was a picture. Maybe it was a thought. Maybe it was a vision, a quick vision in Jesus' mind. And Jesus said to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, look, I saw you. You were sitting under a fig tree. And then that just blew Nathaniel's mind. He said, wow, wow, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. In John chapter 4, we see another example. John chapter 4 is the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus went to the well in Samaria, and he met the Samar Samaritan woman, and they had this big, long conversation. We can read it. We're not going to read the whole thing in John chapter 4. We'll read a little, a little bit of it here. Uh, but if you want to go back and read it, it's a great story. Jesus met this woman... And she was living a lifestyle not pleasing to the Lord. And they were having a conversation. In that conversation, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. This is in John chapter 4, verses 16 to 19. Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Yep. You have, you have said, well, I have no husband. But the truth is, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. So Jesus, being led by the Holy Spirit again, got this word, got this revelation from the Holy Spirit about this woman. And just in the simple truth that he said, the truth is, 
you have had five husbands. And the one you're with, that's not your husband. And this is her answer. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Later on in verse 28 and 29, the woman, the, the woman left the well, left Jesus at the well, went back into the city. It says in 28 or 29, it says, The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Could this be the anointed one? And so because of that revelation that the Holy Spirit spoke to Jesus, Jesus spoke the words to the woman, and it brought change into her life. It brought a revelation. It, it, it showed the power of God speaking through Jesus, but it was also a word of transformation into that woman. And that woman went out and led all of the city back out to meet Jesus. And many believed in Jesus. Jesus and his disciples stayed there a few days talking to them, telling them about the good news. So we see twice, with, once with Nathaniel, once with this woman, that Jesus received a word from the Holy Spirit. And as he spoke it, it brought change. I also told you there's going to be a third story. This story just happened just a number of years ago here at New Life. And I have permission to share this story. Um, many of you will know Min Sopa. She's been with the church a long time and a member of our church, a believer. She's actually on staff here. We have a, a, a pastor who comes on a regular basis. His name, his name is Pastor Gary. And one of the things that he likes to do is minister prophetically, where he'll, where he'll pray over people and just speak to them. And, and he lets God, he lets the Holy Spirit speak through him into the lives of other people. And I remember this. I remember exactly where I was. I remember exactly how it all happened. And Pastor Gary was praying over Sopa. And one of the things that, that Pastor Gary said is he said to her, he said, I see you writing in a book. Nobody knows about this book, but I can see in my spirit, I can see you writing. You have your pen and you have a book and the book is blank, but you're writing in the, in the book. And I just remember that time. It, so Pa just began to cry and cry and cry. Because God was speaking to her through Pastor Gary and was saying, not so much that it was Pastor Gary speaking, but it was God who saw her writing in that book, writing down the thoughts in her heart. And it just brought a change. It just brought a revelation. It just brought a breaking. It, 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 was, it was her crying, but it was tears of joy that God cares so much for her and God has her hand God knows and God has his hand on her life and it just brought such a great amazing change at that moment I still remember it just like it was yesterday all three of these stories are examples of what we would call a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom where God uses somebody through the Holy Spirit to speak to another person to show how much he cares and how much he loves that person. With Nathaniel, we see that Jesus saw him sitting under a fig tree. Oh, well, that's, a, that's not really a big deal, someone sitting under a fig tree. But the fact that Jesus knew and saw Nathaniel touched Nathaniel's heart in such a way that Nathaniel said, this, this, is, this, is, this is the king. You are the king of Israel. You are the son of God. With the woman at the well, Jesus said, the truth is, you had five husbands. Now, he did not say it in a condemning way. We have to remember that in all of these things, the gifts of the Holy Spirit must always be centered in love. Obviously, Jesus did not say it in a condemning way because the woman would have just said, no, 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 that's not true. 
But she said, wow, I can see. She saw his love, and as a result, she believed. Then she went back and told everybody else, come, see, can this be the Messiah? Can this be the Christ? That was her question to everybody else. And then with, obviously, with the story that just happened just a few years ago with Sopa, it was just a revelation of God's love for her. That even in a difficult time, a hard time, when she was writing and pouring out her heart to God, God saw her. And it just touched her heart so much. These would be examples of what we would say, two gifts of the Spirit, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. What is the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge? Two separate gifts. I'm going to explain both of them individually. But I just want to go back and look at a little bit of the background of what was happening when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. In Acts chapter 17, we see that Paul and his friends traveled to the city of Athens. Now, Athens is in the country of Greece. You can still travel there and go there today. And Corinth, which is the city where the church in Corinth was, was only 68 kilometers from Athens. So we have these two cities. We have Athens, and then we have Corinth. In Acts chapter 17, G uh, Paul went to the city of Athens. In Acts chapter 18, he went to the city of Corinth, and he was ministering in each of those cities. In Acts chapter 17, when he was in Athens have to understand that in that day, Greek culture was one of the top cultures in that day and in that age. We see the whole Old Testament was written in the Greek language. So the, so the Greek language was the primary language spoken in the world today. The country of Greece and Athens was the center of what we would say would be modern thought or modern reasoning, understanding, wisdom, knowledge, all centered in the country of Greece. And it was that way of thinking, that way of applying wisdom, that way of uh, thinking and thought. People would sit around, the scholars would just sit around and, and talk about different ideas, talk about the newest idea. And you can even go back in history and see how influential the Greek culture of that day was. Even till today, some of the words that we use in, in different languages are influenced from the Greek culture, even the way of thinking, influenced by the Greek culture. But in that day, Greece was so, so important. And Athens was one of these places where people would, would come together together they would reason together, they would think together, they would talk together, and they were always talking about knowledge and wisdom and understanding and new ideas. And this was the whole atmosphere of Athens and of Corinth. But it also, even though there was so much, in, um, so much importance placed on thought and thinking and reasoning, there was also a lot of uh, there's a lot of other gods that they served in these cities as well. When Paul was in Athens, in Acts chapter 17, he saw an altar with an inscription. It was written on the side. It was carved in the side of this altar. It was an altar to bring sacrifices to a god. And they had many, many different gods. And they had this god and that god. Lots and lots of different gods. But... In Athens, there was one altar, and on the side of it, it said, To the unknown God. To the unknown God. And the reason that they had that is because just in case, just in case, you know, they have this God, they have that God, they have that God, but just in case there was a God that we didn't think about or that we don't know about, we need to make a sacrifice to them just in case we don't know enough. We haven't understood about all the gods. We have to make this one altar to the unknown God. And so they made an altar and they put right on the side of it. 
This is for the unknown God, the God that we don't know. And Paul used that, and he said, what is unknown, I am going to make known to you today. And he began to speak with them about Jesus and salvation and the whole story all the way uh, from God's creation. And, and he, he revealed to them what they did not know. He revealed to them the, the one true God. Then in Acts 18, it says he went, uh, it says that Paul traveled to Corinth, which is very, very close to Athens. It's only 68 kilometers. And so even though it was a place of reasoning and a place of thought, they had all these other gods. And it was same was true in Corinth as well. In Athens, they had many gods. Corinth, they also had many gods too. But if we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul begins talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit by saying that the Christians in Corinth no longer need to serve mute idols. Meaning idols, like we saw in Athens, to the unknown God or to the gods that they knew about, that had the form, but they couldn't speak. They had mouths, but couldn't speak. In different, parts of the, in different parts in the Bible, I think Isaiah, I think Psalms also talks about the idols that have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have ears that they cannot hear. They have eyes, but they cannot see. And Paul said, these gods are gods that cannot speak. They are mute gods. And if we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul begins that chapter... He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these mute idols, however they were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so he's begins by saying all those idols, they were mute idols. But when he begins to list the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's very interesting that he uses the gift of the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And in certain translations, it says the utterance or the, the speaking forth of wisdom or the speaking forth of knowledge. And, and it's interesting because he said, those were gods that cannot speak, but the Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, wisdom in that day, in that Greek culture, it was a wisdom that we see in, the, in, in different parts of 1 Corinthians, we see that there was a, a worldly wisdom or a human wisdom that was logical and thinking and reasoning. And in, Acts, or sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see Paul talking about that wisdom. And he says, people who have that wisdom think that believing in Jesus is foolishness. They think it is foolishness. Just believing in someone who died and rose again, it's foolishness. But Paul makes a special, he, he, he shows the difference between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. And he says the wisdom of God is foolishness to, to men, but it is the power of salvation. In, Acts, or sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, Paul says the Greeks seek after wisdom. But he says that the world did not know God through human wisdom. Meaning that we don't come to an understanding of God through human wisdom. He also said that the gospel of Jesus seems like foolishness to the Greeks. But Jesus became wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctifi sanctification, and redemption. 
Listen to the words that Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. He said, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. So, the gift of the word of wisdom is a wisdom that is not from man, but it is a gift of reasoning and decision-making based on the power of the Holy Spirit. It may seem like foolishness to some, but it has its foundation in the gospel and the cross of Jesus Christ, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So what does this look like? What, is th what this looks like is when maybe you're talking with someone and you have a heart for them and you're wanting to, to help them and you're, they're asking you about different things or maybe you're praying for somebody and God just speaks to you something. The Holy Spirit just speaks to your spirit and says, tell them about this or say this word to them. And it's a, a word of wisdom can be, it, it's, it's based on, like, like Paul says, it's based on the Spirit of God. It's based on the wisdom of Jesus. And it brings a direction. It brings a truth to somebody's life. It's like shining the light so that people can see the truth that is all around them. And a word of wisdom will help people to know that God is there with them and they'll know what they need to do and the choices that they need to make. Not for the wisdom of man, but because of the wisdom of God. And I don't know, maybe you've heard stories or you've heard different things where people have just said, I, I believe that I need to do this. I'm not sure why, but I feel that God wants me to do this. And it's something that somebody does, not because it makes sense, but because it honors God. And so they say, okay, I'm going to do this because I want to please Jesus. I want to do what's right. And so they'll make a decision in their life. Maybe it means doing this, or maybe it means taking this job, or maybe it means going this place, or studying in this spot. And they'll say, I, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but God is leading me in peace. And this is the word of wisdom that God speaks. And sometimes God uses people to speak that word to other people. There's also what we talked about in the stories, the word of knowledge. This is similar to wisdom in that it is divine knowledge, but it comes from the Spirit of God. Like with Pastor Gary and Sopa. When Pastor Gary saw her writing in the book, he just he didn't know what that was about. He just knew it was from the Holy Spirit. He was obedient. He didn't know the, what the outcome was going to be, but he just said, I just see you writing in a book. And boom, it just triggered something in her because God was revealing something of his love in, in her life. And Gary, Pastor Gary, he was just the messenger. He just said, yep, I'm just going to do what I feel the Spirit of God showing me to do. And it brought forth great fruit. And it's a word of knowledge. It doesn't come from man. It comes from the Spirit of God. It comes from knowing Jesus more and more. Paul says in, in Philippians 3, verse 8, I count all things lost for the excellence of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Wisdom, the gift of wisdom, the gift of the, uh, the, gift of the word of knowledge, they all have their core in Jesus. Wisdom would be applied understanding and good judgment based 
on the Holy Spirit. Knowledge is also an understanding of facts and information based on the Holy Spirit. So what do these things look like in practice? What do these things look like? Sometimes, like I said, sometimes when we're talking with somebody, sometimes when we're praying for somebody, we feel like we have a word that maybe doesn't make sense to us, but it will make sense to them. And sometimes as Christians, I know from my experience, sometimes as Christians, when something doesn't make sense to us, we feel afraid. We feel, oh, they're going to think I'm crazy for saying this, or they're going to think I'm weird for mentioning this. Or Now, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be weird about it when you're talking to somebody. You can just say, hey, look, I just have this feeling that God wants you to know, da 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 and you tell them. And sometimes you might be a little bit afraid. You might not understand the message. But we have to understand that as Christians, it's not our job to understand it because it's not our message. It's God's message for that person. We are just the delivery person. The delivery person doesn't know everything that's in the letter. They don't know everything that's in the package. I received a package at my house today. The delivery guy, he didn't know what was in it. He didn't know what was in the box. But for me, I know who sent it. I know what's in it. And for me, it's a blessing in my life. But when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and when we speak the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge, we just have to be faithful to deliver it. It's not for us. It's for that person who's receiving. So we always just, it might not make sense, but don't worry if it makes sense or not. Just be faithful to deliver it. It is something that the receiver needs to hear in order to make a decision or help to confirm something that is happening in their lives. It will help them to see what the path of wisdom in their lives would be. When God gives a word of knowledge, it's a revelation that God knows them, that they're not alone, that God sees them. Even in the most secret times of their lives, God knows them. And it will bring just a revelation of God's love that he's always there. He always cares. He's never left them or forsaken them. It will confirm that they are loved and that God is always with them. So we always must be faithful as people who, are, who want to use that gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As we close today, just to help us to understand a little bit more about these two gifts, what would be some guidelines? Guidelines to using the word of wisdom and using the word of knowledge in our lives. Number one, always, always, always be motivated in love. In this series, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, but in the middle of those two chapters is 1 Corinthians 13, which is all about love. And the beginning of it says, if I can prophesy, I can do this, I can move mountains, I have faith to do this, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. Always remember, every gift of the Holy Spirit must be motivated in love. If you're doing it with some other motivation, you're doing it wrong. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it to lift yourself up. Be motivated by love. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, as we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, the gifts of the Holy Spirit always seek to build up, to encourage or to bring comfort. That's what the three things, that's the three things that the gifts of the Holy Spirit do. Encourage, build up, comfort. Someone should never come away with a gift of the Holy Spirit feeling defeated, feeling depressed, feeling ashamed. No, that's not what the gift, that's not what love does. Love builds up. Love strengthens. Love comforts. And that's what our motivation needs to be, too. A word of wisdom or a word of knowledge will never, ever, ever contradict the Bible. Never. It will never be something that's different 
than what the Bible says. When we look at the Greek where it says the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge, it actually uses the word logos. Logos is the, the, the revealed, complete word of God. It's also the same word that is used in John chapter 1 where it says in the beginning was the word, talking about Jesus, the logos, the revealed word of God. So everything that we see in the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge must be aligned, must be lined up, must be the same as what the Bible says and what is revealed in the ministry and life of Jesus. Another guideline when you're using a spiritual gift and you feel like God's working through you, working, uh, this Holy Spirit's working through you, don't be weird in the words that you use. You don't need to use a lot of Christian words, especially if you're talking to someone who is a non-Christian. Don't say, oh, I believe the fire of the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Oh, I don't want to burn up. I, you know, don't use lots of Christian type words that we would use uh, in a, you know, that would be understood by another Christian. But use words that are simple. Just use, I, I, I feel that God just wants you to know his love more. And just be simple in the words that you use and how you explain it. Ask them questions. Have a conversation with them. This is what I do, what I do lots of times too when I'm talking to someone and I feel like God has something for them. I just say, hey, you know, I feel like God wants you to know. And then I just tell them the words that God's given to me. I feel like God wants you to be comforted in this. Or I feel like in the past you may have experienced da 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 And most of the time, when I treat it that way, it's not weird. They, there's real understanding about it. And we can just have that conversation. Just like you know, Jesus had with Nathaniel, Jesus had with the woman at the well, and God reveals his love to them through these conversations. Sometimes you might ask questions. You know, do you feel, do you ever feel, you know, maybe God's, the Holy Spirit's putting it on your heart that this person has suffered with depression. Do you ever feel, you just ask them, do you ever feel depressed? I feel like God's asking me to pray for you about being depressed, for an example. And just be real. You know, people want to know the love of God, but they also don't want to be around people who kind of make them feel weird. Just show them love in a real way. All, like I said before, always remember that you are the delivery person. Be humble in your approach when you talk to people. Approach them with humility, not in pr pride or condemning. And always be motivated in love with a desire to lead people to Jesus. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for us. They're for the people that are around us. We are the delivery person. God wants to minister to people all around you. And he wants to do it through you. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And if you have doubts or if you don't know, if you have received the Holy Spirit yet, I want to encourage you. Meet up with your small group leader. Meet up with some of the pastors and say, I want the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. I want to have a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit. We can help you with that. We can help you. We can encourage you along that way. And as you begin to do that, and as you seek these gifts of the Holy Spirit, step out in faith. Step out in faith and begin to use these gifts as they come to you. Because God wants to use these gifts, wants you to use these gifts, not for your sake, but for the sake of all, all those people who are around you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are real and you are a known God. You are not an unknown God. 
but you are a known God, and you reveal yourself to us. It says in Isaiah 55, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways. Who can know your ways? But you reveal them to us by your Spirit. And Holy Spirit, even right now, right in this moment, we make room for you in our lives. We open up our hearts to you and say, Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives. Make us more like you. Help us to walk in the Spirit of God. Not to walk in the ways of the world, but to walk in the Spirit of God. Help us to begin to use these gifts of the Holy Spirit for the sake of those who are around us, that they would know, like Nathaniel did, that they would know that you are the King, that you are the Son of God, that like that woman at the well, she would know that you are the Christ. God, not for our sake, but for your sake and the sake of all those people who are around us. We want them to be connected to you, oh God. So Lord God, we make room for you. I believe that this week, in some of you guys who are watching and listening, I believe that the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. And he wants you to make room for him in your life. Maybe that means putting down your phone in the evenings and just seeking Holy Spirit, listening to worship music and trying to get into the presence of God. Some of you, it may mean stopping doing this or doing that and opening up the Word of God to read so that the Holy Spirit can fill you more and more. It's making room. It's saying, this time, this is for the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants you to take those steps. Make room for the Holy Spirit in your daily life. God, I just pray for a new revelation of the Holy Spirit in each one of our lives. Help us to live by the Spirit, lifting up the name of Jesus and loving those who are around us. Thank you so much, God, that you are with us, that you never leave us, never forsake us. We give our lives as a trust into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have an awesome, awesome week. Amen.